welcome to worship at Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Wherever you are joining us and whenever you are joining us, know that you are welcome as you are for who you are because God loves us as we are for who we are. Today, Sunday, June 28th, we will be offering curbside communion as part of our worship service. You are invited to come today to Bethlehem between 12.30 and 1 p.m. to receive communion in a drive through fashion. We do look forward to seeing everybody today. Also, please note that Bethlehem's office will now be open to the public once again from the hours of 10 a.m. through 2 p.m. on Monday through Friday. And finally, BLC's or Bethlehem's council met this week and approved a recommendation to begin in-person worship on Sunday, August 2nd. Now, there are a lot of details to work through, so we will be communicating those details to all of you later on in the month. Our worship begins as we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we pray that in the midst of our joys and our fears, in the midst of our anxieties and our hopes, in the midst of our weaknesses and our strengths, that you will walk with us. As followers of Christ, send us out into our communities to work for justice and to practice mercy, that the world might be changed and life would become a reality for all people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23 in the New Testament. Sin is an enslaving power which motivates us to live self-serving, disobedient lives. Sin's final payoff is death. We, however, have been set free from sin slavery to live obediently under God's grace, whose end is the free gift of eternal life. The reading begins at verse 12. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you get then from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Kids at home. Join me and our early childhood friends as we introduce the gospel for today. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus. 
Afternoon or whenever you're watching this. Uh, again, this is another one of our Chad's Chats, and I'm here with the Early Childhood Center friends. And so I'm always so happy when I can come talk to you guys. So you need to help me because there's a story that people are going to be hearing when they are watching this uh, worship service that we're that we're recording. And it's a story today about welcoming people. So when I go to somebody's house, they often try to welcome me. And if you want to make somebody feel special, and if you want to make somebody feel good, what, what can you do? You can help them. What else can you do? You can be nice. Give them the snacks. You can give them like some treats, some snacks. Or a toy shark. A toy shark. You can do that too. I have a toy shark. I have a toy shark. You have a toy shark? So we could give people sharks. That's good toys. Here's one thing that we can also give people. When I often go over to people's homes, they say, Chad, can I get you something to drink? And I'm like, huh, yeah, I think you could. So here's my question for you guys. What's your favorite drink? Like if you were to go to some place and they would say, what would you like to drink? Chocolate milk. Chocolate milk? Okay, so so here, let me just, with the, with the raise of hands, how many people love chocolate milk? Raise your hands. How many people like apple juice? Raise your hands. Me, I like both. You like both? What about grape juice? How many people would drink something like warm? Do you like hot chocolate? No. Yeah, I'm not a fan either, actually. But, so let, me, let me tell you something guys, so people who know me really well and people who want to really welcome me, they know what I like and they will always say, hey Chad, do you want, what do you think my favorite drink is? If you had to apple guess. juice? It's not apple juice. Pepsi? It's not Pepsi. Coke? I, it's, nope, it's not Coke. I, I, I call it the nectar of the gods, and it is a Diet Mountain Dew, the best drink in the entire world. Do you believe me? You're not buying it, are you? No. But for me, that's what I like. And when people offer it to me, I feel welcome and it feels good. In the story that people are going to hear, Jesus is always about inviting people to be welcoming. And you guys can make people's day. You can make them feel good and special when you welcome them into the early childhood center, when you welcome them when somebody comes to your house by doing all the things that you already said, by sharing your toys, by giving them sharks, by getting them a drink. So that's what I want you guys to know today. What's that? and giving them food. So that's what I want you guys to remember today and our people at home is that when we welcome others, we are doing what God would have us do. So thanks for joining us today. We'll see you again next week. Holy Gospel according to the 10th chapter of Matthew, verses 40 through 42. And I read here from the NIV. 
The one who receives you receives me, says Jesus, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and anyone who receives a righteous person because he is righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And anyone who gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. The Gospel of the Lord. You log into the usual site to see what's been happening. Maybe it's National Review, CNN, Fox, Apple News. You glance at the headlines. You usually pick up on things you, that catch your attention, don't you? What do you notice? What inspires you? What worries you? Certainly we can't help but sensing the national restlessness and the anxiety that whispers we're not where we ought to be as a country and maybe we don't know how to get there. Or if we did, we won't go. Now imagine as a Christ follower logging into a new site called Matthew 10, verse 40 through 42, you see clips and articles and about the kingdom of God and Jesus sending people out. But what gets your curiosity is that little phrase, little ones. Jesus promises a reward, even for giving a cup of water, to a little one because they're a disciple. That's odd, you think. And you also notice the word receive. It appears eight times in two verses. Little one and receive. So you click on little one. It's an expression of the time, you find. It can mean children, but it's also used to describe people who have no standing in the eyes of society. Maybe they're still young, maybe they're pupils, but also maybe they just simply don't have any power or privilege or social standing in the world's eyes and never will. Hmm. So Jesus refers to little ones here. He's describing some of his disciples. Why call them little ones? Some of the future leaders are these little ones. You see a clip entitled, From One Little One to Another, A Message That Rocked an Empire. And you press play. You're taken to a dreary place, off the grid, so to speak, in a Russian police state, which was called the USSR. Alex is a former army officer in the Red Army, and he's serving a 20-year sentence in what's called the Gulag because he referred to Stalin as His Majesty in a letter to a friend. And he's one of three to five million prisoners, mostly political, who inhabit a vast system that's hidden from the public eye. Harsh, cruel, inhumane, many of these prisoners don't see their own release from forced labor. And Alex is at that point in a couple of ways. He has cancer, and he just had surgery by one of the camp doctors, who's also a political prisoner. He's not expected to live long. That's where our story begins. Alex is coming out of anesthesia, and a camp doctor sits down with him and begins to talk. But besides cancer, Alex is experiencing 
a dying of his soul. His communist idealism was shattered a long time ago. And now he's questioning the whole purpose of existence. Does life have any meaning? Does the doctor sense this? We don't know. Why does he sit down next to Alex? They didn't know each other well. He hardly knows him. But what Alex hears from the doctor is something strange, a strange thing that in a camp like this. The doctor shares with Alex that he has found a new faith in Jesus. Now, Jesus is somebody that Alex had long ago rejected as he became an ardent young communist. And during this conversation, however, Alex senses a, a spark of hope in his soul, a kind of ray of light that will continue to grow over several years as he is in fact as he, in fact, will survive cancer and he will become a Christian. As for the doctor, he was bludgeoned to death that night by an inmate with a grudge. So what we have here is two little ones. Nobody's in the Soviet system sharing and listening to a new faith in the darkness of vast, hidden Soviet, Soviet prison system. And in the world's eyes, this conversation would be of no account. Now, some of you may guess that Alex, as I've called him, is actually Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who became a Christian prophet of sorts, known by the whole world, and a Nobel Prize winner for a book he smuggled out of the Soviet Union called Gulag, Archipelago, which incidentally kind of delivered a fatal blow to the whole system. Now you're curious. What about that word receive? It appears so often, and it seems to connect to little one. Jesus says that even giving a cup of cold water to a little one because he is my disciple will have a reward. Well, Alexander did something he received and listened with interest. The story of the doctor, perhaps the man's last act before dying, receive as he finds out once he clicks it, has to do with hospitality in a way. And that's why in the RSV, it's translated welcome. When a disciple comes to the village and a message is received or welcomed, he's invited in the house, so to speak. Receive is the opposite of reject. Jesus prepares his disciples for the fact that they will be rejected and uh, maybe even hated, but they're simply told to move on where you will be received. So receiving here is about being open to hear. It has to do with one's soul sometimes. The Bible often put it poetically. It says, do you have ears to hear? Or do you have ears that can't hear the word of God? But it's not just hearing, it's doing. Perhaps that's why Jesus says, uh, when he invites people, abide with me, remain with me. It's like, live with me, live in me, I in you. So you notice how receive dominates what Jesus promises here. Let me read it again. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. And anyone who receives a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he's a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. So you spot a clip. 
This one's entitled, You Can't Give What You Haven't Received. You click play. Now you're taken even farther back in time and you meet a man named John Wesley, who I'm sure you've heard. He's a promising young preacher in England and he has all the gifts you could possibly ask, but he's come to a crisis in his young life. He was sent over to the American colonies, Georgia and South Carolina, to preach. And he was a dismal failure. More than one bishop came up to him and said, Sir, you will not preach in these parts again. And his audiences were indifferent to his message. What's wrong? He must have wondered. This is a devout, Oxford-educated man with all the trappings of success and zeal to live for God. And he's struggling now with his own sense of unworthiness. And then a turning point happens. He's back in England and he goes to a mission one night. It's on Aldergate Street, a famous street in Methodist circles. And he hears a reading on Romans about how God works through the heart and faith in Christ to change you. And then John writes, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and for the assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. You can kind of hear it if you, if you listen carefully. For all his training and all his intelligence and zeal, down deep, John Wesley had never received in his heart what he probably knew perfectly well in his head, that God loved him. Yes, even him. And when that deeper awareness came as a gift that he received that night, everything changed. It's like a before and an after. He found his voice. And as you know, John Wesley became one of the greatest preachers in the English language. And his sermons were known, interestingly, for conveying a warmth of the heart. And he's especially had an impact on England's many poor people. He was a champion against slavery and a champion for prison reform. So now you've looked at little ones and receive. As I've looked at those two words, I, I think I understand Matthew, these three verses, a little better. And maybe you do as well. The first thing is about the little ones. I think Jesus deliberately sent out his disciples without money, without a weapon, without um, an extra tunic or a staff or even food so that they were totally vulnerable and at the mercy of those that would receive them. They were sent out as the little ones they truly were because anybody that would see them saw no trappings of anything else. So they learned firsthand where the power is. Power is not about them. They carry the message. The power is the power of God's word and God's presence. That's the real message. And in the church, that's something we have to remember because sometimes we get focused on the church and almost lose sight that the church is about reaching out with Jesus to the world, not the church. I guess what I'm saying is, before God, aren't we all little ones? Not any one of us have the power to make somebody else believe. We can carry the message. And when we're willing to share it in word and deed, then 
It's God's power that starts to do things. And we are honored for doing it by God. The other thing about receive, you can't give what you don't have. And for all his training and his zeal, it sounds like John Wesley in his early life was trying to do it himself. And he certainly was as talented as you can be. It wasn't until he had continued to receive what God would give him, including something in his heart that reassured him that he was loved and he was warmed by that feeling, that sense of God's love for him, which came new to him, interestingly enough. That's when everything changed. And so what I take from this story, especially as I thought about Alexander Solzhenitsyn and John Wesley, is never underestimate even the simplest act of faith that's done in Jesus' name. Not even giving a cup of cold water. You never know what's going to come from it. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God has called us to a new time as Bethlehem Lutheran Church. It is a time of reflection and prayer, a time for expectation and hope. We need a shepherd to lead our flock, and God has promised he will provide that for us. The following persons have been appointed to serve as the call committee at our church. And since this is going to be on Zoom, would you just raise your hand because there might be people in our congregation who don't recognize your faces, but they'll put a name with your face and that would be wonderful. Kara Gordon. Heidi Hovis. Nancy Shogren Peterson. Jim Magnuson. Eric Keel. Mike Reagan, Cheryl Running, not with us yet are also on the call committee, Russ Weeks and Jen Lisi. Dear friends, you have been duly appointed to serve as the call committee of Bethlehem Lutheran Church in order to seek a lead pastor. Sacred scripture guides us in our task to seek a pastor who strives for righteousness and godliness, faith and love, endurance and gentleness, a pastor who is a servant of Christ himself, who is Christ as, him, as Christ himself was a servant, a pastor who is not domineering or quarrelsome, but leads with care and concern for God's flock, a pastor who is filled with the Holy Spirit and a trustworthy steward of the mysteries of God. Yours is a spiritual endeavor on behalf of this congregation. Are you willing, therefore, to be open to the Spirit's leading and by prayer and holy conversation 
to undertake this calling to seek a shepherd for us? If so, answer yes, by the help of God. Yes, yes. yes. by the help of God. Will you be diligent in your seeking, careful in your listening, purposeful in your questioning, and respectful in all you do? Again, if you'd answer yes by the help of God. Yes. yes. Will you seek the Lord's guidance through Holy Scripture and prayer and in your deliberations with your fellow committee members until you are brought to one mind and one will in Christ and a chosen God shepherd for us? Again, yes, by the help of God. Yes, yes. By, the by the help of God. God. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone are the great shepherd of the sheep, and we turn to you to lead and guide us in all things. Our trust and hope is in you. As you have raised up faithful servants of your holy word to tend your flock in each time and place, send us now, we pray, a faithful shepherd to lead our flock. Give us holy patience in this time of seeking, a patience that trusts in you for our present care, knowing that your will, you will bring our good work to fulfillment in your time. Bless those who are especially called to serve on the call committee. Give them the gifts they need to seek and find a pastor of your own nurturing, a shepherd of your own choosing, that we might be fed by our holy word and sacraments to grow in faith and love and ministry. All these things we ask, O oh God, with whatever else we need, in the name of him who is the good shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I now the declare that you have been installed as the call committee of Bethlehem Lutheran Church. May God bring your good work to fulfillment and grace in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for the many ways in which you give to support the ministry of this place. Your financial gifts are so important over the summer as we begin to develop new worship formats, an entirely new faith formation program for the fall. Also, our call committee is meeting and should begin interviews early in July, as we work to build a strong ministry team for a new time. Thank you for your tithes and offerings. now join our hearts in prayer as we pray for the church, for the world, and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, send your guiding spirits to help unite your church on earth, to heal its wounds and to mend its brokenness, so that it may clearly reflect the kingdom of God, welcoming all in Christ's name. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, as followers of Christ, open our eyes to see the needs of this world and move us as your servants to do your will. May your church be a place where justice is proclaimed and practiced so that all people would find welcome, healing, and hope, especially those that are so often discriminated against in our society. Give us the courage to speak out and to work for peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, give healing to all those who are sick, either in body, mind, or spirit. Come to the aid of all those that call on you this day, especially those that are known to our community. We pray for Lillian Johannes, Jake Rodriguez, Bonnie Larson, Lauren Magsum, Jolene Perkins, Claire Halter, David Marin, Rick Thompson, Carol Baird, Becky Eisenwinter, Kathy Eggert, and those we now name in the silence of our hearts. Gracious God, grant these individuals healing, even if they cannot be cured. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray that they might find comfort and hope, knowing that you walk with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All this and whatever else you see that we need, we pray to you in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Our service continues as we prepare to gather around the Lord's table in new ways. So much of Jesus' ministry focused on who he ate with. Everyone was welcome at the table, and Jesus calls us to do the same. And so it is right that we should at all times and in all places that we give thanks and praise to you, O Lord, holy God, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to all to drink saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We join our hearts in prayer as we pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Again, we invite you to come today between 12.30 p.m. and 1 p.m. for communion here at Bethlehem. Come for all is ready. All are welcome.
Now receive God's blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Abide in God's peace. Thanks be to God. Thank you.